A very good evening and a thank you for joining us in this Bible study. For this Bible study this evening, uh, we are studying the rules of Bible study and so far we have covered six of these rules. Yesterday, we looked at the law of context, which is quite simple to understand that you take every verse within the context in which it appears. You never separate the verse, you never take a verse out of its context because that would become a pretext for you to teach whatever you want that verse to teach. And we have seen that God also gives us four warnings, two of them in the Bible, two of them uh, we understand by uh, common sense. Two, the first two are that you do not add to the scriptures, you do not take away from the scriptures. The third warning is, again, never remove a verse out of its context. And the fourth one, uh, you never go to the Greek or to the Hebrew to prove what you believe or to change the words of the King James Bible. So that was the law of context. <clears throat> Today we're going to look at the law, firstly the law of negative discrimination. Now if you're wondering what in the world this is all about, I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. Negative discrimination. What we are going to do is we are going to look at both these words separately, negative and the discriminatory uh, nature of the scriptures. The negative nature of the scriptures and the discriminatory uh, nature of the scriptures. That's what we are going to look at. <clears throat> Christians generally are carried away by the philosophy of the world. When I'm talking about uh, lukewarm Christians, I'm talking about Christians who do not spend much time with this book and Christians who do not believe that God has preserved all its words in one book in the King James Bible. They're carried away by the spirit of the age and by the spirit of apostasy. So they start thinking like the world and whatever little they know of the scriptures, they try to make that fit into their worldview. And their worldview is a very worldly worldview. That's what it is. And they think like the world. The world tells you always, be positive, think positive, right? It's always, uh, the focus is always on being positive in your attitude, in your thinking, in your behavior, in everything they say, be positive. And that's exactly how many Christians are. They think that, we as Christians should be like that, be positive always, think positive always. Well, there are times when we have to be positive about some things. But the problem with these Christians is that they equal being positive to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ or in the scriptures or in the promises of God in the scriptures. It's not, they are not equal. Being positive is an attitude that you have uh, irrespective of the situation that is you know you just convince yourself that everything's going to be all right and you think positively even if something is clearly negative you train your mind to think positively about it that's the way the world does it and that's the way many christians go about the whole thing they talk about self-esteem they talk about positive thinking they talk about self-love your best life now like joel, Aust uh, joel austin teaches that's a bunch of rubbish. Your best life now? It can't be more contrary to the scriptures than that. But that's what they teach. They say, you know, uh, tolerance, inclusion. These are the words the world loves. And uh, peace, brotherhood of mankind, fatherhood of God and all that kind of nonsense. You know, that's, that's how the world thinks. And there are many Christians who think just like that. But you see, unless you realize this, that the Bible is a negative book, you will not be able to understand a lot of things in the Bible. The Bible is a negative book. It is very discriminatory. That's right. I'm going to explain it. I'm going to prove it from the scriptures. All right. But you see, positive thinking to the most part is very devilish. In fact, the first positive thinker in the Bible is none other than the, the, the serpent, right? In Genesis chapter 3, he appears to Eve and the first word that he uses is not no, 
right? That is negative. What is the first word that the devil uses with Eve? Yea, hath God said. You see how he begins on a positive note and then directly attacks the words of God? That's the spirit of the age, the spirit of the serpent, that's the spirit of the devil. Positive thinking. But like I've said, the Bible is a very, very negative book. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Many of you know what's there in chapter 2 and immediately you know what I'm going to refer to. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. We'll read verses 1 to 3 in fact. Ephesians chapter 2. Verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had a conversation in times past, in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. What is this? This is the Bible's view or God's view of man. What kind of a view does God have about mankind in general? Read those verses. It's talking about an unsaved world. Look at the words that are used to describe these people. It says, you were dead. Okay, this is uh, the Bible's view. Of man not a positive view at all it says you are dead in uh, sins and trespasses that means you know the Bible says that they are sinners they're dead in their sins and trespasses uh, they walk according to uh, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of disobedience. Disobedience. Children of disobedience. Wow, what a beautiful view that is, right, of mankind. Children of wrath. children of wrath, fleshly and all those things. See, that is the view that God has of mankind. Is it a positive view or a negative view? Right, that's a very, very, very negative view that the Bible has of man, of lost mankind. Look at also <clears throat> John chapter 8 and verse 44. John chapter 8 and verse 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. So that means, he's saying that they, mankind, lost mankind, are children of the devil. That's not my opinion, that's the opinion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Children of the devil. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 23 and verse 33. Matthew 23 and verse 33. Ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? So he calls them serpents and vipers. And he says that they are going to go to hell. They are going to hell. Not my words, it's the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 25 and verse 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Since their father is the devil and they are the children of the devil, they and they themselves are serpents and uh, they end up 
in the place that has been prepared for the devil and his angels. They go to hell. In spite of the clear teaching of the Bible on the subject, preachers today preach and say, Oh, God loves all of you. God loves mankind. God loves the sinner but hates the sin. And all this kind of rubbish is not biblical. What does the Bible say? Look at John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Uh, we look at uh, verse 36. John chapter 3 verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Present tense. Wrath of God. abides on them that's what the Bible says about these people the unsaved people it doesn't say God loves them it says the wrath of God is upon them and that's why he's going to cast them into hell where they will burn forever and ever Look at uh, Romans chapter 7 and verse 18. We need to settle this once for all because I know that many, many, many Christians, almost most of the Christians in this world are uh, brought up being taught that, you know, God has a very positive view of man. All right. And you look at the rubbish that is preached by these charismatic men and women, especially uh, in the charismatic church. It's all this sort of rubbish, a positive view of man, completely. Not biblical. Look at Romans chapter 7 and verse 18. And the reason why we are doing this is because this is important for you to correctly interpret the scriptures. Unless you see the nature of the Bible, that it's negative and discriminatory, you will not be able to understand certain passages. Scholars and Bible teachers come up with uh, fancy words for uh, passages where you know a lot of horrible things are said by God's people against the unsaved and they say oh this is just that kind of language that the writer uses to describe something else and all that nonsense no they mean what they say they absolutely mean what they say look at Romans chapter 7 we'll read verse 18 Romans 7 18 for I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing for to will is present with me but how to perform that which is good I find not he says in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing absolutely nothing good about mankind in the flesh and those who are not saved are in the flesh you see, this is the view that the Bible presents about uh, man. Not at all positive. Look at the description that the Bible gives. So many of those. There are still many I can show you. Look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, we'll read verses 13 through 18. Romans 3, 13 through 18. I'm not going to write the list that is mentioned here because it's a long list, but you can listen carefully and read in your own Bibles. Romans chapter 3 verses 13 through 18. Their throat is an open sepulchre, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. That's how the Bible describes the unsaved world. And in the light of such clear passages in the Bible, preachers preach that God loves the world. God loves the sinners. The Bible never says that God loves sinners. It doesn't say that at all. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope 
and without God in the world. No hope. No God. This is the negative view that the Bible gives of mankind. Now you tell me, is this not right? I mean, I just read all the passages to you and it is very clear there are hundreds of more verses. It's a negative view. Negative view. And the Bible is a very negative book right there in Genesis, remember? Just before God destroyed the whole world with the flood, what did he say? He said, man is wicked and evil in his, uh, in his imaginations right from his uh, childhood, right, you know, right from his youth. He grows up thinking evil and uh, sinful things. God gave up on mankind at that point and wiped them out except Noah and his family. That's because it's a negative view that God has of mankind. And the Bible presents this negative view again and again and again. I'm just giving one example that God has a negative view about man. The Bible is a very negative book. Take for example the gospel. The gospel itself, we call it the good news, but it's a very negative message, isn't it? Think about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 1 to 4, Paul gives us the gospel uh, in a nutshell, let's look at that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4. But for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also re received, how that Christ died. Christ died. Dying is negative. For our sins, our sins, negative thing. Sins are negative, they're not positive things, right? Then he goes on, according to the scriptures, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried. He was buried. What is it? Positive or negative? It's negative. You can't say, oh wow, what a wonderful thing, I'm going to be buried, right? It's nothing positive about that. It's a negative thing. Christ died, negative, for our sins, negative. He was buried for our negative. And then it says, he rose again, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. He rose again. At last, one positive. 75% at least of the gospel message is negative. It is not a positive message. And the entire Bible, wherever you see, most of the times, everything that the Bible says is quite negative and against the spirit of the world. The spirit of the world is positive. But when God speaks, it's mostly negative. Most of the things that he says are negative. And it is uh, false teachers and false prophets who present a positive view of man and this world and everything else. It's the false teachers and I'm going to show you that too. Look at Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 17. Jeremiah chapter 23 and verse 17. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone, uh, everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. <coughs> Let's go ahead and read a, uh, a couple more verses there. Verse 19. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. Verse 20, the anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed and he, uh, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it perfectly. Look at that. 
That is God's mind. He's saying, uh, they say to those who despise me, you will have peace. Isn't that what these false prophets do, these false teachers? There you have unsaved people who are on their way to hell, who despise God, who despise this book. And they say, oh, you're going to have peace. You're going to prosper. You're going to be healthy. You're going to be healed of all your diseases. All your debts will be gone. You'll be so happy with your family. This is what they preach to those who are on their way to hell. No doubt they love to go to such churches and listen to such preachers because they are, they're just giving them that positive message. What does God say? You are saying they will have peace to those who despise me and you are saying that no evil shall come upon you. But this is what I am going to do, he says. His fury has gone forth, it shall not return. It will fall as a whirlwind upon the heads of the wicked and destroy them forever. That's what God says. You see the message of the Bible? It's so, so negative. You read through the prophetical books of the Bible. You read anywhere for that matter. You will find this negative aspect. Notice that. Make a note of that. Understand that. Let your mind begin to think in that manner, biblically. So that when you approach the scriptures, you will be able to easily understand uh, the passage that you're considering and be able to interpret it when you understand the negative nature of the book itself. So you see that the gospel is negative and God says, don't preach a positive message when everything here is negative. Now let me show you how false prophets, false teachers are the ones who preach positive messages. A good illustration of that is 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. We'll read a few verses there. We'll begin with verse 6. Here you have uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat ready to do battle against the Syrians. So just before they go, the prophets of Baal come and they prophesy to them saying, uh, uh, let me read that verse to you. Uh, okay, we'll come to that, but let's look at verse 6. Then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? Yeah, this is the verse. And they said, Go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. You see that positive prosperity gospel there? Go, you will prosper. You will succeed. You will have victory. Just go, they say. But of course, Jehoshaphat was a man who feared God. And he was very uh, taken aback that Ahab was inquiring from these prophets of Baal instead of asking a prophet of the Lord. So he says in verse 7, And Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? Look at verse 8. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Now, Listen very carefully to these words. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him. Ahab is saying there is a prophet of God here who can tell us what God thinks about this battle. But I hate him. Why does Ahab hate him? For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Ah, there is the problem. Ahab is not getting what he wants to hear from Micaiah. That's the problem. And Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Do You see, that's the spirit of the people. They want to hear positive messages. They don't want to hear negative messages. They want to hear only positive messages. Oh, go, you're going to have victory. Oh, every place the sole of your uh, foot touches will be yours. Go. That's the kind of thing they want to listen to. Look at uh, verses 10 and 12, 10 through 12. 
And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a wide place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. You can imagine the scene. The kings are sitting there and all these prophets in a frenzy dancing about probably. You have the drumbeat there which makes them go into a frenzy and all that. And they are prophesying before them saying all good things. Go up because you're going to win. Verse 11. And Zedekiah the son of uh, Kineana made him horns of iron and he said, Thus saith the Lord. With these shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. A wonderfully positive message. Verse 12. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. There you have it. For the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. A positive message. A power-packed message according to the charismatics. Anointed message from the prophets of Baal. That's what it is. Prosperity. Positive. That's the spirit of the devil. It looks at people perishing. I'm talking about the spirit within these so-called Christians. They see people perishing, going to hell, lost without the Lord Jesus Christ, dying in their sins, going to hell. And they preach to them just like these prophets of Baal. Go and prosper. God is with you. God is going to bless you. He's going to increase you. Uh, what is that? Uh, you know, go and uh, increase, uh, you know, the size of your tent and all that kind of stuff. That's what they preach. That's what these people preached. Now look at it. There's still something more interesting here. Look at verse 13. And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him saying, look at this. This is classic. Behold now. The words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them and speak that which is good. This fellow Zedekiah, whoever it was who went to call Micaiah to come and stand before the kings, is giving him uh, uh, you know, you know, this advice. He's saying, go and preach a positive message. Go and preach the prosperity gospel to Ahab and Jehoshaphat. It's all right. It's another matter that they're going to go and die in the battle. That's another thing. You just preach positive. Be positive. Think positive, Micaiah, is what he's trying to tell him. What does Micaiah say in verse 14? And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. This is what a man of God does. This is what a man of God does. What the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. Now think about it. If you have ever thought, why is it that Bible-believing Baptist preachers, who are very, very few in number, preach a message which is quite contrary to maybe 75 or at least 60 to 70 percent of uh, the preachers in the world? And you say, you are a minority, you are just a few people. Look, the majority of the great men of God, they are all preaching differently. Why is it that you people are teaching contrary to what they are saying? That's because you are heretics, you say, to Bible-believing preachers. In spite of the fact that Bible-believing preachers are a minority, they still stand their ground like valiant men. And that's because they know one thing. They know what God has said to them and they speak those words to the people. That's right. All these great men, <coughs> Bible-believing preachers who have gone before us, that's what they have done. They took a stand for this book, for the King James Bible. They never turned back. In spite of all the onslaughts of the devil, all the attacks uh, of their enemies they said no we are going to stand they say what is this all the majority of the greatest Bible teachers say that you need to go to the Hebrew and Greek to know what God has said imagine Micaiah saying that here as the Lord liveth what the Lord saith unto me that will I speak imagine him saying 
Whatever the Lord has said, I'm going to check with the original Hebrew to see if it was really from the Lord or not, and then decide, and then compare it with the lexicons and the dictionaries, and then decide what I'm going to say. No. What the Lord said, that's what I'm going to say. The Lord said what he wanted to say in this book, the King James Bible. And it's our duty to just say it. Just say it. That's what Micaiah did. Now look at uh, verse 15. So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? Now look at this. This fellow hates Micaiah. He's, he said it himself. He said, I hate him because he never preaches anything good to me. But he still asks him the question for the sake of Jehoshaphat. And he answered him. Look at this. He is uh, being very sarcastic. Micaiah is being very sarcastic. He says, go and prosper for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Do you see that? He's just mocking that king, saying, this is what you want to hear, right? So fine, I'll also say what you want to hear, like the rest of these prophets. But Ahab immediately knows that uh, uh, Micaiah is being very sarcastic. Look at what he says. And the king, in verse 16, And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee, that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? What a hypocrite Ahab is. He just said he doesn't preach anything good concerning me. That means he only wants to listen to the good, whether it's true or not. It's immaterial for Ahab. And when, he, when Micaiah actually preached what he wants to listen, what, what he wants to hear, he attacks him again and says, how many times should I tell you to speak the truth? As if Ahab is really concerned about the truth. He is not at all concerned about it. Look how... Uh, how conflicting his uh, speech is here. So when he says that, he says, speak the truth in the name of the Lord. Micaiah says in verse 17, and he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. What is that? His message went against the majority of the prophets there. One man standing with the words of God while the rest of those prophets were preaching lies. Why am I saying this? It's because you see, he gave, just gave a negative message. All of them were saying, go and prosper and succeed. He said, if you go, you will be defeated. Go back to your tents and then you will have peace. Desist from fighting. Don't go to the war. Go back to your tents, Israel. Otherwise, you'll be scattered as sheep without a shepherd on the hills of Israel. That's a negative message he gives them. Look at verse 18. This is very funny, really. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? Look at this man. He just said to Micaiah, Give me only the truth. And when Micah gave the truth, which is negative, he didn't want it. He complains again like a kid. Ahab is just like a kid. He's always been like a kid, right? Remember how he sulked when he didn't get uh, Naboth's uh, uh, vineyard like a child. Sulking, not eating, not talking to anybody. Till his wife came and got him that vineyard by killing Naboth. Once again, you see this tantrum thrown by Ahab. Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? This is the spirit of the world. They don't want to hear the truth because it's negative most of the times. That's why the world hates the gospel. Because it says that Jesus died. For what? For our sins. That makes them sinners. They don't want to accept that. He was buried. It's a very... Uh, they don't want to listen about death and the shedding of blood and being buried. They don't want that. They want all positive things. Oh, our God came with a big sword and, you know, he destroyed all the enemies that he had and he established a great kingdom. That's the gods of most of the religions, right? Powerful, strong. They don't want to hear about a meek and lowly savior who came and who died as a criminal upon the cross. 
They don't want that. Because it's negative. That's why the spirit of the world, the spirit of the age is against the spirit of the Bible. The world thinks positively, speaks positively, and it only receives that which is positive. And they do not like the negative message and the negative spirit of the Bible. So, the Bible has a very negative view of man and it is false prophets who preach a positive view of man, a positive message and all that. The Bible is very negative and you must keep this in mind. Not only is the, the, the Bible negative, like I've said, but it's also very, very discriminatory. How is that? Let me show you that. Let me just give you one example. The Bible discriminates between races, between people. Even when it comes to the Savior, the Bible is very, very discriminatory. And I'm going to show you how that is. I think uh, that's all we would be able to do in this Bible study. And we would not be able to go on to the next law. But that's all right. It's very important that this is my heart is, you know, uh, very burdened to make sure that you really understand this because it is of such great importance. The Bible is negative. Look at it. Understand it. It's very negative. It's not giving the world a positive message. Yes, it is good news because our sins will be forgiven if we trust the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. But the message itself is negative. You must see that. Everything. Everything is so negative when it comes to the Bible. But I'm going to show you why the Bible is very discriminatory. Let's talk about races first. The races. Look at Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17 verses 26 and 27. Acts chapter 26, sorry, uh, Acts chapter 17, verses 26 and 27. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Now if you stop there, this is what the world loves to hear, right? This part of that verse, the world would love it. What is it? Oh, that we have all been made of one blood. Right? They love to sing about these things. Oh, there is no white, there is no uh, black, there is no brown. We are all the same. We are made of one blood and all that. But you don't stop there. You listen to everything that God has to say on that. It says, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and had determined the times appoint, uh, before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Do you see that? God has made the bounds of their habitation. Now if you remember, the world was repopulated after the flood through the sons of Noah. That would be Japheth, Shem, And Ham. These are the three men through whom the world was populated after the flood. The three sons of Noah. The three sons of Noah. And the Bible says God divided them. That's right. We have just read it. And had determined, though he made all men of one blood, he had determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation the bounds of their habit god decided where each of these races would live that's right whether you like it or not god divided god didn't integrate them god didn't say shem ham japheth all of you get together and become one big family did he say that think about it think about it it's important. Everything in the Bible is, you cannot ignore it and say, oh no, that's something that happened in the past, has no relevance to the present. Don't say that. Think deeply about it. 
God made sure that they were not just one big family all living together in one integrated society, an ecumenical uh, uh, society. No. He set the bounds of their habitation. It's a strong thing there. He made sure they all had their bounds, their limits, their borders so that they may live there. Why did he do that? Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they may feel after him and find him though he be not far from every one of us. God separated them and kept them in their bounds so that wherever God has placed them, there they might seek him and find him among their own people, among their own race. That's what God intended. He set their bounds. He, he uh, made sure that they were all separated. Now look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32. We'll read verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8. When the Most High divided to the nations their inheritance, He divided the inheritance to the nations. Make note of that. When He separated the sons of Adam, He set the bounds of the people according to the number of the children of Israel. Again, you see that separation, the setting of bounds of the people. Well, this verse is talking about how God foresaw, right? God is all knowing. So, how Israel is going to be, and according to that, He divided the nations right from the beginning. And that's what you will see in the book of Genesis. If you look at chapter 11, you will find there the divisions that God made according to the families, according to the races, and all that. You will see that. But this is so clear in the Bible. God doesn't uh, integrate. He doesn't bring together. He separates. And you will see that right there in the beginning of the Bible in Genesis chapter 1. God is a great divider. People say unity, unity and peace, right? United Nations, they say. Let's all be united. Let's all be one uh, community, brotherhood of all mankind. And all that rubbish goes against the spirit of the Bible. God divides. He divided between light and darkness, between day and night, between the firmaments, between the waters, all sorts of things. God divides right from the beginning. God is a great divider. And he divided the nations and set their bounds and gave them their inheritance. Especially after the flood, that's what happened. Shem, you have Japheth, Shem and Ham. The three sons of Noah. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 19. Deuteronomy 4 verse 19. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldest be driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. What does it mean? In all probability, this is a reference to the constellations, the 12 constellations. And remember, we have already read that God divided the nations according to the number of the children of Israel. That doesn't mean according to the whole population of Israel. That's like the stars of heaven, like the sand of the sea. That's not how he divided. The 12 tribes, the 12 constellations and 12 nations. That's how God would divide the world. If you say there are no constellations and all that, well, if you're a King James Bible believer, you know they are there. It's called Maserat in the book of Job. It's very clearly there and God divides the nations into 12 groups, it says. Into 12 groups. Whether you like it or not, this is the truth. God divided Japheth, Shem and Ham. God divided them. He didn't put them all together and say, be one big happy family. So Japheth, you have uh, the Germanic people, the Latins, the Greeks, the Slavonic, basically the white people, right? 
And then you have Shem. Shem would be Israel. It would be uh, India. And the Mongolite race. The Mongoloid uh, race, that would be the Japanese. Japanese and all uh, uh, these people here, of course, the Chinese as well. We don't want to miss them. The Chinese and all these. Well, of course, India here seems like a misfit, but uh, the land that is occupied by Shem is Asia and India is in Asia. So in all probability, according to most Bible teachers, India uh, Indians are Shemites. Well, uh, I have uh, some doubts about this when I study Indian history and things like that. There might be a mix of uh, Shem and Ham in India as well. Well, we have pure Shemites in India in the northeastern part. Uh, the northeast Indians, they are from the Mongolite race. And then we have other people as well. We have Japheth in India in the northern parts of India. We have Ham in the southern parts of India. So it's a big mix. But generally, Shem is in Asia. So here, these are in Europe. And these are white. And these are in Asia. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right, Asia. Is that correct? <laughs> Sometimes I have trouble reading words. I sometimes read letters, uh, you know, backwards. That's a big problem. I know there's some name for that disease. I don't think I have that, but it happens sometimes to me. And uh, generally, these are called uh, yellow. I don't know what. Let's call them brown because that's how, uh, you know, it could be. Then you have, of course, Ham, who would be Ethiopians. Generally, all Africans but also the Arabs, right, um, Kush, um, what is the other, Mizraim is Egypt, right, all these are the sons of Ham and they occupied uh, this part, Egypt, Egypt is known as Mizraim in the Bible many times, uh, so all of these people together are the sons of Ham and they occupied Africa. The Canaanites also, the Canaanites also uh, are Ham, but they were in the wrong place. They should have been in Africa, but they occupied the land that was given to Shem. That's why the children of Israel had to drive them away from there. And uh, they of course are known as the black people. This is how God divided. Look at it. Don't you see clear divisions? In everything you see a difference between these three. Look at the culture. The culture is very different. The culture of the white man is different to that of the brown man and the black man. And so also it is with uh, the others. They are not the same culture. It's all different cultures. The skin color. The skin color is different. You have white or yellow, brown, whatever it is, and black, different colors. It's not the same, not at all the same. God divides and God hates those who take away the bounds that he has set. God sets bounds, we've already seen that. God sets boundaries and says, okay, Shem, this is where you're going to live. Don't cross your boundaries. Japheth, this is where you're going to live. Don't cross your boundaries. Ham, this is your place. Don't cross your boundaries. Find God wherever you are. Now, that's why in the Bible, uh, God is very particular, especially when <coughs> sorry, comes to Israel. What does he say? Do not intermarry with the other races. Do not do that. And throughout the Bible, you see that marriage between uh, two people from different races is not very good. That's not God's intention for those people. But nowadays it's become a very uh, um, fashionable thing to do that. And when people like me preach like this, they will call us 
all sorts of names they have uh, for people like us, right? They'll call us haters, they'll call us, uh, uh, maybe I don't know if you could call an Indian a racist, I have no idea. But if this comes from a white man, immediately it would be called racism. Oh, you are a white man and you say a white man should not marry a Shemite or a Hamite? You are a racist. Or a Shemite should not marry a Japhethite or a Hamite? You are a racist. Or a Hamite should not marry these two? You are a racist. That's what they say. You see, that's the spirit of the world. That's not the spirit of the Bible at all. It's not the spirit of the Bible. Look at what God says in Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 13. Isaiah chapter 10 and verse 13. Isaiah 10, 13. For, he saith, by the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. Who is saying this? If you go back a few verses, it's the Assyrian, the Antichrist. Wow, look at that. God, Jesus Christ, they put bounds for people. And the Antichrist comes and removes the bounds. That's because that's the, uh, the Antichrist is the epitome of the spirit of the world. The spirit of the devil. You see how it is dead against the spirit of God. God says segregation. God says keep them separate. The world says integration. Bring them all together. Unity, peace. It's against the spirit of the Bible, brethren, whether you like this or not. I know, especially uh, in uh, white countries, right? Especially in the white countries, people are brainwashed from their childhood into thinking like that. Like, uh, you know, oh, you should not say segregation. You should never talk these things. These are taboo. Don't say these things. We should say integration. It's uh, racism. To speak like that. No, it's not. It's being biblical when you speak like that. It's the Antichrist, the spirit of the Antichrist that says unity. Now, of course, I didn't speak about the United States of America. It's certainly a part of this. The reason why I didn't put it there. Well, biblically for certain, God very clearly said that uh, Japheth will go and live in the tents of Shem. Uh, and that's what happened in the United States. Right when the Europeans went to the United States, Shem was already there. The Indians, so called Indians, they were Shemites. So you have them going and living in the tents of Shem. But the thing is, United States, uh, a picture of the United States is uh, the beast, you know, the beast that is uh, described in Revelation chapter 13. He's like a leopard, an integrated animal, right? He's got all three colors. He's got white, brown, and black, or yellow, if you, if you may. White, yellow, and black. He's got black spots. He's got a white belly and yellow skin. Uh, what is that? White belly, yellow skin, yeah, all that. He's got the whole thing. It's because all three come together. All three colors come together in this one animal. And that's how it is, right, with America. You have all three races living there. And they say, oh, it has to be, there has to be unity and all, all that kind of thing. Well, I'm not saying you go and fight against the other races. I mean, if you have any common sense, you will not think that that's the message I'm giving. What I'm trying to say is you must be careful about not mixing races because God doesn't intend to mix these races. He intends to keep them separate. He set their bounds so that they would be separate. Now, this, uh, this kind of thinking that's found in, uh, in the United States naturally comes over to countries like India. Now, even in India, all the educated young people, you know, they have the same spirit. Oh, you are such a backward fellow to say, don't mix races. You are such a narrow-minded fellow. And that kind of talk is what we get when we preach like this. But we don't care because that's what God says in this book. Look at Hosea chapter 5. Hosea chapter 5, we'll read verse 10, Hosea chapter 5 and verse 10, 
Look at this. The princes of Judah were like them that remove the bound. Therefore, I will pour out my wrath upon them like water. Okay. God hates it when people remove bounds, boundaries. Boundaries are kept for a reason. Right? Now, I'm not uh, trying to speak politics here. But I think uh, I greatly appreciated the thinking process of the previous president of the United States when he said you have to put up a wall. It makes so much of sense. You want to protect yourself, you need walls, right? That's what you do around your home, you put up walls. Especially here in a place like India, you put up walls around your homes to keep the enemy out or to keep unwanted people out. If anyone has to come in, they have to come in the proper way. There is a proper way. And when people come in a proper way, you invite them into your home, you sit down, you speak to them, you give them food, all, all that's fine. But there have to be bounds, there have to be boundaries. I don't know if that president was saved or unsaved, but certainly his thinking was very, very biblical there. And that's what we need, people thinking like that. <coughs> That's what you don't find. But God says, I will pour out my fury upon these people, the princes of my wrath upon these people like water, the princes of Judah, because they remove bounds. They are like those people who remove bounds. God hates it. He set bounds for the people to keep them in their places. He appointed those boundaries before. He divided and separated the nations according to the number of the children of Israel. That's right, that's the teaching of the Bible, whether you like it or not. Not only does God separate between races, but think about when it comes to the people, to all the people in the world in general. When it comes to all the people in the world in general, what did God say? Did God say, I have chosen all the people in this world to be a nation before me? Did he do that? No. What did God say? He said, God is discriminatory, right? So we are talking about God being discriminatory because the Bible is a negative book. It's very discriminatory in its nature. God discriminated between the races. He chose Shem. God discriminated even within this uh, race and he chose Israel. He didn't say, oh, all of you people are my children, all of you I'm choosing to be a nation. He didn't give the promise that he gave to Abraham to everybody. He chose one nation, one man in fact, out of the whole world. And he said, only you Abraham, only you and your seed will be a nation before me, a great nation before me. And that promise has not been uh, uh, forgotten by God. He's going to fulfill that promise after the tribulation. That's right. The discrimination continues. Well, only in this church age, thank God, there is no Jew, there is no Gentile in Christ. In Christ. In the body of Christ. There is no male, there is no female. In Christ. As far as salvation is concerned, it's everybody is equal. But otherwise, that's not the case. That's not the case. Think about this, even when it comes to the man and woman and their functions, God has been so discriminatory, right? He said the man is going to be the head of the home. The woman is going to be a help to the man, help meet for the man. That means a help who's suitable for the man. Women don't like it. They fight against it, right? And the women's lib was a big thing and it still continues even today fighting for equal rights and all such nonsense when they don't what they don't realize that those people who do that I'm not talking about godly women uh, but I'm talking about the women of the world when they fight for equal rights they are lowering they, they are saying bring us down to the level of man they don't know women are special in the Bible they should be treated with great respect but they say no no we don't want that we want to be like the men <laughs> look at Leviticus chapter 20 I'll read verses 24 to 26. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 24 to 26. But I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land, and I will give it unto you to possess it, a land that floweth with milk and honey. 
I am the Lord your God which have separated you from other people. God separated Israel from the other people. Isn't that discrimination? God, you have created all mankind. You are supposed to be the father of all mankind. How can you play favorites? How can you be partial? How can you discriminate like this? But he does. He did. Look at that. Verse 25. Ye shall therefore put difference between clean beasts and unclean beasts. And unclean and between unclean fowls and clean. And ye shall not make your souls abominable by beast or by fowl or by any manner of living thing that creepeth on the ground. Which I have separated from you as unclean. And ye shall be holy unto me for I the Lord am holy and have severed you from other people that ye should be mine. Tell me that's not discrimination. Look at Exodus chapter 8 and verse 23. Exodus chapter 8 and verse 23. And I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. There in Egypt, once again, God is saying to, Egypt, uh, to Pharaoh, you people are not my people. The Israelites are my people. It's God who is saying that. God chose one man, Abraham, out of the whole population of the world. And gave all the promises to him and to his seed forever and ever. Look at what the Bible says in the book of Romans about Abraham. Romans chapter 4. Uh, verse 13, quickly here, for the Romans 4.13, for the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham, uh, uh, to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Abraham and his seed will be the heir of the world. Wow, why only Abraham? Why not others? God discriminated, that's why. <coughs> he separated Israel. He chose Israel above everybody else, above every other nation. That's how God does. Not only did he do that with uh, the people of Israel, but even in Israel, he chose Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem, he, the city that God chose, he chose and he rejected all the other cities of the world. All these great, uh, what do you call these cities nowadays, uh, that name it slips my mind, but what are it, all these big, big cities in the world like New York and London and Paris and here in India you have Mumbai and all these big cities. Those are not the ones God chose, he discriminated against them. There's only one city that God chose, it's Jerusalem in Zechariah chapter 14. Look at what God says in Zechariah chapter 14. Look at verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth, in that day shall there be one Lord and his name one. Verse 11. And all men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more uh, utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. Look at verse 16. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the uh, feast of tabernacles. Verse 17. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon them shall be no rain. Verse 21. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts, and all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seed therein, and that day they shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. Discrimination. God choosing one race out of that one family, made them into 12 tribes. Out of that chose one tribe to bring his king into the world. One city is chosen. God doesn't say, let's include everyone, let's include everything. The whole world is mine. All the cities are holy. No. God does not do that. Think about it. When it comes to the Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ... 
What does the Bible say? The spirit of the world is this. All religions lead to the same destination. They are different paths to the same goal, to the same destination. Is that what the Bible teaches? No, absolutely not. It discriminates against every other religion in this world, against every other God in every religion. What does God say? I am the only God, he says. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. I am the only one true living God. Worship only me, he says. He claims exclusivity just like the Lord Jesus Christ did. Look at what he says in John chapter 14 and verse 6. I'm sure you have this verse memorized. John chapter 14 verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He claims exclusivity. He says, I am the only God or I am the only Savior. You want to go to God, I am the only way. I'm the only truth. He didn't say, oh, truth, you know, truth. Uh, all religions uh, teach the truth in a different way and all that nonsense. No. He said, I am the truth, the only truth. I am the life. You want life? It's only through Jesus Christ that you can get life, eternal life. You want the forgiveness of your sins? You get it only by trusting in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. There is no other way. You see how he claims exclusivity. So you have the Savior. He is the only, only way. He doesn't say, let's include Buddha and uh, Krishna and uh, all the other gods. All of us gods together will show you the way. No, he never said that. He said, I am the only way. The only path to God. There is no other way. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, he said, except by me, Jesus Christ. Even when it comes to the book, you must understand this. God didn't give you many different contradictory translations and said, you choose what you want, embrace everything, learn whatever you can from all of them. No, he inspired and preserved only one book. And that's called the King James Version or the Authorized Version of 1611. The fact is, if you want to understand the spirit of the Bible, this is important. It's very negative in its approach to everything. It is very discriminatory. And unless you get this, you will not be able uh, to fully understand the scriptures. Now, uh, this is the law of the negative discrimination, the law of negative discrimination, which you need to understand and make it a part of your thinking in order for you to be able to better understand the scriptures. All right, uh, thank you very much once again for joining us. I hope this Bible study has been a blessing to you and uh, the Lord willing, we will meet again on uh, Sunday morning, Indian Standard Time. That would be at 8 a.m. Indian time. That's when we are going to have the next Bible study. And until then, the Lord be with you. Thank you.